euh, il a fait. Euh, donc, il est très connu pour des travaux qui peuvent faire en tout cas physique depuis. Il peut toucher essentiellement à toutes les techniques auxquelles on peut toucher euh, en neurosciences cognitives computationnelles. Euh, et euh, il est connu pour avoir appliqué ses travaux dans la vraie vie. Donc, il y a, il y a peu de chercheurs en neurosciences cognitives là, qui, peuvent se, qui peuvent se targuer d'appliquer leurs recherches et de faire des différences dans le vrai monde. Si vous avez envie d'essayer certaines, certaines de ces applications, vous pouvez. Il a une application qui s'appelle euh, Sightseeing, qui était anciennement qui s'appelait Ultimate Eye. Euh, Sightseeing, si vous voulez l'utiliser, euh, il va falloir que vous communiquiez avec lui apparemment parce qu'il y a des petites choses à spécifier. Là. En tout cas, si vous utilisez Sightseeing, vous allez améliorer votre vision. Il a montré que ça améliore la vision euh, sans avoir besoin de changer vos lunettes. C'est votre, euh, votre cortex cérébral, de, votre système visuel qui, euh, qui est ciblé par sa euh, Donc, Aaron, après ses études postdoctorales au Harvard Medical School, a eu un poste de professeur-chercheur à Boston University. Ensuite, il est allé en Californie. C'était la côte ouest, et puis il est resté là un bout de temps, à UC euh, Riverside, et puis là, il est de retour sur la côte est euh, à l'université de Northeastern, près de Boston, euh, et il est directeur du Brain Game Center for Mental Fitness and Wellbeing. Donc, euh, sa recherche, il l'applique en faisant des applications euh, qui, euh, qui sont ludiques. Euh, ce qui favorise l'apprentissage, puis euh, euh, l'apprentissage perceptif en particulier. Donc, il a fait des travaux euh, sur un paquet de thématiques. Je n'ai pas le temps de vous en parler aujourd'hui, mais il va vous en parler un petit peu lui-même. Il a travaillé beaucoup, beaucoup sur l'apprentissage perceptif, l'attention, l'apprentissage en général. Euh, et euh, je pense que j'en ai assez dit. Donc, je vais laisser la place à Aaron, mais c'est vraiment un honneur pour nous. Euh, de, recevoir aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, uh, Alain, d'avoir accepté yeah. notre invitation. Merci. Uh, thanks um, for having me here. Um, and so, I'll, I'll repeat a little bit of my background, just because I like kind of explaining from my perspective of just how do you find yourself, you know, in your career. And so, starting off, um, you know, as I already said, like I was a math major. Um, are you able to hear? So after I finished my undergrad work, I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do next. I um, actually went to Seattle um, and I started working at a software company. And so my kind of first professional experience was a software test engineer. And this will become important later on where basically I was finding bugs in software. Um, it was interesting. I didn't really want to continue doing that. So I went to grad school. Um, actually, before grad school, actually, I did a post bath work. So to get to, you know, from math into eventually cognitive science, I just took a lot of classes at University of Washington um, and you know, try to establish some credentials. And actually, this is the first time I got some real experimental psychology um, work. Um, I did some work with Elizabeth Loftus, actually, on false memories, which was kind of fun. Um, and that led me to go into computational neuroscience, which is my PhD, which was combining um, some of the psychology I was getting really interested in and neuroscience, kind of with my math background. Um, then, as I already said, I went to Harvard Medical School, um, where... Most of my research at this point was kind of informed by animal research. And so I wanted to get a sense of like, what is it like to actually record from neurons in the brain? Um, and how do they respond compared to what my model showed, um, which the reality is quite different. Um, and so I spent a few years doing that. And then I eventually um, became a psychology professor, but kind of really having this circuitous path, you know, All these experiences have been really important to what I'm doing now. 
And now, actually, there's quite a few different projects that we work on. So, um, you know, the Brain Game Center for Mental Fitness was uh, kind of already introduced. And the idea here is that we're really trying to create applications that can address, you know, cognition and cognitive learning in different circumstances. And so we have some projects that focus on educating children. So we have a project where we're looking at how do we measure executive functions in the classroom um, in order to be able to improve learning opportunities for Black and Latinx school children in the U.S. We have other studies that are trying to understand cognitive aging and uh, develop new approaches to either train memory or vision or hearing um, in people as they age. Um, we have some projects that focus on mental health. We have other projects focused on obesity. Um, we have some work that we've done in warehouses and factories. Um, and all this really is involving kind of taking technology as a way to be able to better measure aspects of cognition and to train it. And then using this to be able to reach people who are at different ages in their life, who have different cognitive concerns, um, and you know, try to do something that's going to impact the real world. Um, a lot of this work um, involves this field of brain training. Um, and this field is one that is really quite exciting. So if you think about you know, physical fitness, as we learn more about the cardiovascular system and muscle physiology, we were able to come up with ways to train athletes to make them stronger, faster, more endurant, jump higher than ever before. So science has definitely improved athleticism. Well, what if we could take what we know about psychology and neuroscience and improve brain functions? This is something which is really appealing. Um, there's a lot of belief structure that it could work. At the same time, there's all these companies out there that are very controversial. So, you know, Lumosity is probably one of the most famous, but you also have Brain HQ, Peak, Elevate, CogMed. Um, some of these are more focused on children, like Jungle Memory, others on older adults, like anti-aging games. And that there's, in fact, about maybe six years ago now, I'm losing track of time because of the pandemic, but there's a consensus statement that came out from Stanford Institute of Longevity and Max Planck Institute for Human Development that really argued against the evidence that these approaches were working well. And so I've highlighted a couple things, you know, one is in blue, no compelling scientific evidence to date. They're specifically talking about brain training for aging. Um, and, but at the same time they say, what I have in red is they encourage continued careful research and validation in this field. So the consensus isn't that it doesn't work. It's that we don't have good evidence. People aren't doing science in the right way to be able to clarify when things work, when things don't. And that instead, you know, they're going straight to market. And that when they go straight to market, well, it's really hard to evaluate when they're helping people versus when they're taking their time away from other things. Um, a couple of years later, there was another consensus statement. So whenever you hear consensus, it means people disagree. So the second consensus statement was saying that um, there actually is really good evidence in the field. Those were mostly focused on the basic science literature. So if you look at the studies coming out of research groups, there's lots of evidence that these types of cognitive training programs can have effects. But if you look at the commercial products, that's the place where there's a little bit less science, ironically. And the big issue in the field isn't that you can't train the brain to make it do things better. It's that learning can often be specific. And so I'll give lots of examples of this throughout this talk. So one example that I'll come back to later in the talk is with cognitive training or working memory training. And so I'm showing you here an example of the NDAC task. I think you can see my cursor here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in this task, you see a series of screens where these blue squares appear at different areas of the field. And so here it's in the lower right, now lower left, here lower right again. If you do get two back, this task is you see, does this match what I saw two items ago? So in this case, this is a match. You know, this next one, upper middle, not a match of two items back, lower middle, not a match, upper middle, it is a match again. 
And so if you practice this, you'll pretty quickly get good at the two bath. You could probably do the three bath, which you see three hours ago. Here's a graph um, from my colleague, Susan Yaki, where she trained a bunch of college students over either 10 or 20 days. And you find that it'll be pretty typical to get from the starting point of about two or three back to ending point of five or six back. Some people get to like the 20 back. Hey, what do you see 20 items ago? It was lower left. You know, it's really impressive how people can learn on this task. So it's clear evidence that something is changing. But then the question is, you go to the grocery store, you try to remember where you're on your shopping list. You might have gotten the 20 back, but you remember you're supposed to get eggs. And so this is really the challenge, is that do training on these very precise tasks transfer to the things we care about in our lives? And so the challenge um, that I've really been engaging with in my kind of you know, current part of my career is trying to make training programs that can lead to real world benefits. And the start has been with this field of perceptual learning um, where I'd spent the dominant portion of my career. And so perceptual learning really is looking at kind of the collaboration between the eye and the brain. So there's a huge industry that's focused on how do we focus light to the back of our eyes? So if I take off my glasses, you're all fuzzy. I put my glasses on, you're less fuzzy. So, you know, glasses, you know, are doing a great job of focusing light to the back of my eye. Other people get um, contacts or cataracts or LASIK surgery. This is something that, you know, we understand optics well. At the same time, if you have a stroke um, or just getting older, you know, what happens is that your brain might not be as efficiently reading out information from the eyes as you would want. And that you could also go blind just by this function of the brain. And so there's much less attention to what are the circumstances in which the brain can be improved in this function to be able to receive the information of the eyes, as opposed to just trying to get it so the eyes have better focus. At the same time, there's a lot of evidence of cases where vision can be approved within experience. So here I'm showing you a picture of a femur bone. It has some lithic metastases on it. So these are cancerous outgrowths of the bone. And so you can look at this and try to figure out like where do you think there's cancer in the bone? I could show you the locations. This was identified by a radiologist I was working with at the time. Um, I could take it away. And you can start thinking, oh, so maybe these are the dark spots in the bone. But you start looking around and there's other places that are dark spots that are not circles here. And so the reality is that it takes a huge amount of experience, often, you know, hundreds of thousands of images that one experiences over, you know, six months to multiple years in order to really train the visual system, not just to know a vocabulary of which things are benign and malignant but also to be able to see them when they're very subtle and informed by subtle differences in contrast, um, line orientation, things of that sort. And so this is kind of a naturalistic case of perceptual learning where for a radiologist, they would see these pretty quickly. But in the lab, people like myself um, and others have trained humans in all sorts of cases. So pretty much anything that you train somebody on, they could get better at. So, um, I can find my cursor. Uh, is it a pointer, actually? Okay. So here, this is like an acuity task where you're trying to indicate which direction the gap in the sea is, and you can make the small and smaller to test your acuity. You can train people to get better at this. Contrast sensitivity, finding a stimulus to noise, like either is orientation or a face. Um, you could train motion discrimination, stereo, color, texture, complex figures. Um, other senses, you could train hearing, you could train people to better distinguish wines, and afterwards they'll buy more expensive wines. <laughs> um, and so generally what we find is anything that you train people on in the perceptual domain, 
you could typically find improvements. At the same time, these improvements are often exquisitely specific to what's trained on. So in this case, you know, if someone's staring at this dot and you train them on an orientation discrimination case task, lower right hand visual view. We train them, you know, for 10 days, they'll get better at this task. Um, under the right circumstances, you then test them, same stimulus, just different location on the screen. Learning often won't transfer to that condition. You could take the stimulus, train them, you know, um, you know, it's rotated to the right, then test them, you know, when the orientation is different. Once again, learning often doesn't transfer. Some of the most exquisite example would be ocular specificity. So I could either put in the eye patch or use something like a haploscope, which the you know mirrors that will show different information to each eye or head mounted display. There's lots of ways of doing this where I could show stimulus just to one eye, train them, performance gets better with time. Then I could switch so that you're only seeing the stimulus in the other eye. And once again, in the right circumstance, the learning starts over. You can see you know the slope is faster, so there's some savings. But that um, there's multiple studies by myself and others that show that even though you have no conscious awareness of which eye is stimulus is presented to, that you could still get learning that's specific to the eye of training. And this has been fascinating in the literature. Uh, you know, it's a good way to kind of get nature papers. It tells you about where in the brain the learning might be occurring. Um, at the same time, if you want to rehabilitate somebody who has a vision need, and you tell them that, come into my lab, I'll train you for a month. And afterwards, if I show a stimulus to your left eye in the upper visual field and it's tilted to the left, you'll see it better. But nothing else. That's probably not what you want. And so they start looking at why is perceptual learning so specific? And one of the arguments is that it's designed to be specific. That people are trying to find tasks that will inform about where in the visual system learning might be occurring. And so it pushed the whole field to train on very simple tasks. You know, so basically, are these two lines aligned? Or, you know, what's the lowest contrast or the most noise you could tolerate and still find this stimulus? And that what's interesting is that even if you train an artificial neural network on these stimuli, you'll find that it will learn a specific solution. It won't transfer. And like, it's a case example. Why should any learning system generalize from a case example? They don't. On the other hand, you know, one could come up with a design principle that would achieve more transfer. Like even training two stimuli um, or training less precise discrimination, we know lots of situations that will transfer more. And so one of the ideas that I've been exploring for a while is kind of thinking in terms of what I call basis function. But it's really just kind of thinking about learning objectives. So if you're going to teach mathematics, you want to come up with you know, some sort of learning outcomes. What are the space of math problems you want people to be able to learn? And then you have to train example math problems that span the dimensions of this space. We could do the same thing with vision. Let's try to figure out um, for spatial vision, what is the dimensionality of this? And there's multiple models, but you know, one idea is so we kind of take a visual system. So the light comes into the eyes. The first part of the neocortex that is responding to this is primary visual cortex. What is primary visual cortex be? The first thing is there's a map of space. So we call this retinotopy. And so this is a pattern of light that was flickered to a monkey for about an hour, um, just on and off. And then this is showing the metabolic activity in a flattened representation of the animal's primary visual cortex. And you can see that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between location of the retina and locations um, on visual cortex. And so it's distorted. So, you know, some you know, curve lines are now straight. Um, you know, some areas are more represented than others. But that it's, um, essentially, we have a map of space. Another dimension is orientation. So you put an electrode into V1 and record from a cell. And the vast majority of cells will have an orientation preference. Some will like stimuli that are vertical, others horizontal, others are the other orientations. Another dimension, and this is one maybe less precisely represented, but still represented, is what we call spatial frequency. Um, so it's really kind of 
how wide or narrow these lines are. Um, and some cells will prefer, you know, kind of wider blobs. Some cells will prefer tighter blobs. And that what's interesting about these dimensions is if you're familiar with a Fourier transform, um, that essentially you could represent any picture by decomposing it into a set of locations, orientations, and spatial frequencies. And so, you know, there's other dimensions. Color, you know, would be adding on to this. Motion would be adding on to this. But um, what's interesting is that pretty much how your cell phone works. So you take a picture on your phone. Um, the most standard method of image compression, you know, has been JPEG compression. And what JPEG is doing is, and it's actually inspired by understanding of the visual system, is so here's a picture of a woman's face. You apply a grid. So this is your map of space. The tighter the grid, the better resolution um, that you're saving. And in each location, you're applying this filter bank. If you look at the first column of this filter bank, they're all horizontal. They're just changing the spatial frequency. Look at the first row, they're all vertical, changing the spatial frequency. These plaids are mathematically similar to different orientations. And so what's happening is that we get a match you know, for each um, area to each of these filters. And that maybe the brain is doing something similar where it's compressing the visual images as a function of locations, orientations, and spatials. Um, there's other models. I think the important thing is that this is at least a principled way to break down what might be some dimensions you might want to train upon if you want to get transfer. The other thing is that if you look at research and perceptual learning, there's been lots of studies exploring what are the conditions where you get learning and when do you not get learning? Or when you get less learning and when you get more learning. And so myself and others have shown that, you know, stimulus reinforcement contingencies, so the way reward is delivered can guide learning. How people attend shapes what's learned the senses work together. So if you basically have sounds that are correlated with the visual stimulus, these can also improve. Um, there's, you know, ones that are based upon, um, you know, temporal frequencies that are thought to relate to synaptic plasticity mechanisms. You could use brain stimulation and biofeedback. Um, the key, one key thing is this multi-stimulus training. So you usually get more generalization when you train across multiple stimuli than just a single one. Um, there's also been lots of learning that people have found from just playing action video games. And um, so what we tried to do was basically extract ideas from each of these aspects of the literature and build them all into this game that was already introduced to you that originally when I created a company it was called Optimize. We now have a free version um, that's called Sightseeing. Um, probably yeah, write to me and I could give you access to it if you need to, but it's sightseeing is now just a free download. And what we did was basically, you know, we created this game, a very simple game, um, where you're blowing up these Gabor stimuli that, um, you know, are showing different orientations, spatial frequencies, and locations across these screens. And that every time you click on one of these Gabors, it's a measurement opportunity. I can measure how bright that needs to be for you to be able to find it. And then I could track your individual threshold and make it harder and harder so you could just barely see it. So when people are playing this game for real, you look over their shoulder, you just see them tapping on what looks like a gray screen because um, it's really just getting to, you know, the just noticeable difference we could detect. And so this is the first part of, you know, the idea that has been guiding the brain game centers. Like come up with a training that you'd hypothesize would lead to generalization. Here, I'm expecting generalization to different cases of spatial vision. The next thing is come up with something that exists in the real world um, or that people care about that one could measure success with. And so in this case, we're trying to come up with what is a difficult visual task that people are doing in the real world um, and what opportunity was baseball. And so we approached uh, um, Smith, who was the head um, Beta okay. coach at UC Riverside and said, 
hey, we want to do a science experiment with um, your players. He looked at us a little funny. Um, we talked a little bit more, explained that, you know, a lot of the pro teams are doing different types of vision training, that this is an opportunity for the team. Eventually, you know, it's like, okay, you can make 1% change in our player's vision. That would be huge. Let's go for it. So we had the players come into our lab for about 30, 25 minute sessions. Um, that was in the fall of 2012. Time flies. And that we're able to then measure their performance on eye charts before and after, and then also start looking at the game performance um, in the competitive season that started about three months after training completed. First, if we look at the vision improvements, what we found was that so this is the trained players, um, where you could see in green the distance vision improved by about 30%, um, closer to 20% for their near vision. Um, the pitchers who were the control group um, who were not trained, we didn't see any changes across this time period. College athletes, reading is important. We also saw that reading speed improved. And so, you know, for some standard measures of vision, we already see that there's improvement. Um, the next was, you know, did this improve baseball performance? We could first look at strikeouts. And so what we found is that year over year, that there was um, about four and a half percent reduction in strikeouts for the UC Riverside team, um, and kind of a nominal reduction for the Big West League. So this is all their competitors um, in the league, and that the Riverside improvement was statistically significant compared to the Big West. League. And in fact, we went back five years, compared every team year over year to the rest of the league, and there's no other example of a significant improvement compared to the rest of the league in strikeouts over a five-year period. Um, so this is kind of one sign that they're doing better. There's also a lot of baseball statistics. So if people are familiar with the book or the movie Moneyball, there's this whole field of saber metrics. And so this allows us to do some kind of more interesting math related to improvements. And so one measure is runs created per out. And so this is essentially a measure of your hitting performance that discounts fielding. So it's how many runs should you have created based on a hitting performance. And we could calculate this on a whole team basis. So that's why there's no error bars because there's one number that we see in terms of the change of ones created per out um, for the team. Um, actually, the all the players who played in that same team year over year versus the Big West League, um, we could also look at maturational changes. We could then apply what's called the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. So this is where you could take your runs created, you compare it to runs allowed, the number of runs that other teams scored on you, and you could estimate how many games should you have won based upon that performance. And we'll do this, you know, first assuming they improved at the Big West League rate, then at their actual rate, take the difference, and this worked out to 4.7 games extra one, so about 8% more games won in a 54-game season. And you know, there's some caveats here. So it's a small sample. We haven't replicated this. You know, there wasn't an active control in the pitchers, et cetera, and so on. But at the same time, you know, what I really want to point out here is what did we do in this development? We looked at what do we think would lead to greater generalization. We tested people in what they actually do in their day. And we're able to find that there's an improvement. And so the key thing that, you know, we've really been trying to do is kind of follow this model, you know, with other studies of brain training. It's like, you know, don't just copy some training that somebody did in a psych lab that was made to find specificity. Come up with what you think should be the generalization, generalization of learning. Try to measure something that people care about. Um, and, you know, it, definitely the players themselves at least cared about baseball. And then you know see you know what you could get and so at this stage you know what's definitely the case is the adult visual system has a great deal of plasticity anything you train it on it could get better the lab-based studies their goal is different than clinical practice typically lab would typically try to understand mechanisms and so if you want to do something that is going to clinical practice you want to apply your understanding of mechanisms 
to what would lead to clinical outcomes. And that's something that hasn't been done quite as much. And the one idea that we've been applying is, you know, this idea of a basis function is that think in advance, what is the space that you want learning to generalize? Define some dimensionality of that space and then try to train across the dimensionality. And that path is one that, you know, should theoretically lead to more transfer. And so when we started the Brain Game Center, we was really trying to figure out, can this framework apply to other areas of cognition? And so here the mission is to research, test, then disseminate these evidence-based applications. So that's why sightseeing is, you know, free to download. And that really start looking at the brain as a collection of circuits that any of these circuits in principle can be optimized. And, you know, what are the ways that we do this in a way that will either improve vision as I just showed you or hearing or attention and memory or even things like happiness and well-being. Like, you know, if these are circuits in the brain that are leading to us feeling happy um, and well, then what would be the way to train those so they're more effective? And I think that this is something where, you know, our research can inform even if it's not so simple to come up with an easy way to do it. So a first use case um, when we started the Brain Game Center was looking at working memory. Training. So this is a field that if you look at the early literature, a lot of it actually cites the perceptual learning literature as you know, um, sustained practice, adaptive training, and kind of the other components that are thought to be important for learning, even though it doesn't really focus as much on the specificity that has been in our literature. And so working memory really is your ability to process, update, and maintain information over a short period of time. So I speak in long sentences. You have to remember what I say at the end of the sentence compared to the beginning to figure out my meaning. That's a use of working memory. Um, I showed you earlier this NBAP task. So this is kind of one of the common ways of training working memory. I showed you this plot where, you know, performance gets better. And, you know, this is an example um, from the same study where fluid intelligence, so in this case, a matrix reasoning task, got better in the working memory training condition compared to an active control. However, the results differ across studies. So there's some meta-analyses that will compare all the states in the field and conclude there's no effects of working memory training and far transfer. There's other ones that look at the exact same set of studies and conclude that there are. There's even meta-meta-analyses that argue with each other. And the details matter. So this is a very complicated but pretty figure um, where, so each of these radii, so with the numbers going around, they're each a different study. And what these different colors are showing are on the inside are different methods that people are trained with. And so some people were trained, oh, and they're all the end back. So some people did a single end back, some people did dual end back. So they're training on two end backs simultaneously, some gamified. Then, um, you know, some of them were more visual, some were more auditory, some were more verbal. So the stimuli varied quite a bit. Um, feedback differed, um, the timing differed. Um, as you start going through the ingredients of these studies, there was only like seven of the studies across these that really have the same trend. So everybody's training something different. They all call themselves the NVAC, but what does that mean? It, it's like, you know, the tasks that the memory system are challenged with differ tremendously. And then the outer ones are the outcome measures. And so we have a couple of different categories of working memory tasks and a couple of different categories of fluid intelligence tasks. But across these 52 studies, there are 30 different working memory tasks that people had studied. There are about 30 different fluid intelligence tasks that people studied. A lot of these have no known reliability. A lot of these don't correlate with each other. And so if every study is using different methods, it violates all assumptions of meta-analysis. You cannot do a meta-analysis on this literature because you assume that just because the name of the training is the same, that's the same thing. But the argument when you go back to perceptual learning is it's the little details of the training that make a difference of whether it's going to generalize or not, or generalize to what. 
And so we then started looking at like, how would we apply a basis function to working memory? Like working memory is not as clearly understood from a neuroscientific perspective as vision. At the same time, we do know a few things. So working memory operates under the diversity of stimuli. So um, if you only train on blue squares at different parts of the screen, there's a very little reason to believe it should generalize to all working memory tests. You know, there are some people who have this idea that working memory is domain specific, but to whatever extent there is, or domain general, I'm sorry, to whatever extent there is a domain general component of working memory, it only explains some percentage of what working memory is. It has to be um, operating on a whole variety of stimuli. And so that's one dimension to think about. Another is that working memory has subdomains. So we have to be able to update information in working memory. So take a new information, forget others. Um, there's some capacity. So how many things can we keep in working memory at once? There's resolution. How detailed information are we able to keep? There's associations um, between items in working memory that actually you know, reduce working memory load if we're able to chunk things together and such. And so maybe we want to kind of train across these different task structures. Then the motivational structure um, is going to change whether people learn more or less. Design is actually really, really important. Like we don't think about design so much when we're doing psychology tests, but you know, one really nice example, um, and this was done by Ben Katz and also Susan Yaki, is so here is a gamified end back task that was done in kids. And so this is the same thing I showed you before, that instead of blue squares in different parts of the screen, you have frogs on different lily pads, um, or you have cats in different windows of a haunted house, or monkeys on different sails of a sailing ship. And then, you know, the kids did these gamified tasks, and then they got, you know, games when they performed well, they got certificates for games and levels, um, they were able to get stickers and other little incentive toys. And so like, there's all these things that made this task really fun. But then they did an interesting experiment. They did a study where they took away all these motivational features. Then they looked at all the motivational features together and then they also took them out one by one. And what they found was that when you had all the motivational features, the kids learned less than when you took them away. Each time they took one of the motivational features away, the kids learn more. So it's not saying that motivation is bad for learning. That would not be the right conclusion. But it does say that if you put them in a way that distracts from the main task, the kids might not learn as much. And so it's like, oh, I just got that one right. I got a gold coin. Do I want like a ladybug sticker or a heart sticker? Oh, the task is still going on. Like, I mean, it pulls you away from what your learning objectives are. And so that one of the things that we've been doing is kind of trying to work on games that would both add in motivation, but won't pull them away from the learning objectives. And so some of our kind of early games, I don't know if we have sound. So I'll turn it down just because it's distracting, but basically what's happening is that this is an old game we made called Recall, where you're, in this case, actually zapping um, the targets of the MBAC task, and you're collecting the non-targets. So you actually have to make a response to every item. And that um, we have, you know, some navigation challenge, which is kind of fun, but you also notice that every stimulus is defined. In this case, you see color, shapes, and the sounds that are all correlated. But on some levels, we'd only show a subset of the stimuli so that you have to be able to do the task on at least three different features in this case. And one of the things which is tough was that basically with this game, we spent a lot of time just getting it so that it would be equal learning for the gamified versus the non game flight task. Um, and then, so this is basically just doing the NBAP task. Here's another game that we have um, called Recollect where they're doing a span task. So now the number of items you remember. So this is updating. This is capacity. Um, this is the multiple identity tracking task. Um, and so here you basically have to remember the colors of these for a long period of time when the colors are hidden and then pollinate the flower with the right colored bug. Um, and so we 
spend a lot of time trying to kind of come up with these games that are relatively fun. So not typically as fun as commercial games, but a lot better than standard psychology tasks. And then start looking at like, you know, when does the game help and when does it hurt? So here's an example of a standard non-gamified color index. So you just see a series of colored circles and you have to do the MBAT task on matching colors. You could create a skin. So this game is similar to um, the frogs and lily pads so that it's a picture show. So every screen you see, you know, a different picture, but you don't actually move the character. You're basically just, you know, matching in this case, same thing, you know, color or color and shape do they match. And the last one is this interactive game where you're actually controlling the astronaut moving across obstacles, collecting objects. And what we find here is that, uh, so we call this first one the lane back, uh, the non game five animal. And so that it actually does okay. Um, the skin condition, similar to the cat study, does worse. So that, because basically it's just a bunch of distractions. Everything on the screen is taking away from the fact that that little object is all you're doing the task on. And here, it depends on the study. Here it looks like the game's doing a little bit better. Sometimes the game ends up being tied, um, you know, with the lane back. But, you know, the key thing really is that if you aren't careful with how you put the ingredients together, that they could subtract rather than add. And another thing um, is personalization. So, you know, all the ta tasks we adapt to the user, but one of the things that we're also trying to do is design for different populations. So that, you know, what might be the best game for college students might not be the best game for older adults. Um, if you want to reach the first population, then maybe you want to use, um, you know, an imagery that is, you know, appealing to people who come from different cultures. And um, so this, once again, these two things, design personalization, are not easy. Um, they take a lot of work. Um, and then the other thing is meaningful measures. So, you know, I showed you before, like if everyone uses different outcome measures, then how do you compare across studies? And so we spend a lot of time, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the talk, coming up with um, assessments that we think are reliable and valid, and then also making it so these are shared. And then the other thing is you need a lot of data. So we have this study where we just paused it um, after we've had like a few thousand people complete and we're going to relaunch it soon. But the goal was to run 30,000 participants on working memory training. And what we're doing here really is looking at taking different types of training. So some gamified, some non-gamified, um, you know, some that involve multi-century stimuli and some that don't. And then crossing them with very different people. Um, so we have in this study, you know, some people are younger, some people are older, people who are coming from different cultures and um, people who have different neurological conditions and really trying to ask the question is not this working memory training work or not? I don't think that's an interesting question. What I want to know is what types of training are going to have what type of effects in which people? And so that there's going to be some people who are going to be very good candidates from working memory training. And maybe any program will help them because, you know, they have a core problem with working memory and that anything will help practice that. For other people that, you know, maybe the working memory is pretty good. They want to have some improvement in fluid intelligence and that maybe there's a different type of training that's going to be helpful to them. And, and so that instead of assuming that every training is going to have the same outcomes for every person and that every training that's the NBAC is going to be the same, we really need to kind of individuate and, you know, start looking at the distribution of these training tasks across people. And then I think we're actually going to see that there's going to be a lot more cases where there are positive results. All go a little bit on the testing side, just because it's another key part of what we do. And so one of the things which is kind of the interesting time is that, especially if you start looking at, you know, cognitive testing, that we're moving from a time where like tests are paper-based, which is, you know, still the standard in many hospitals and such, to the time when digital tests um, are starting to take over. And there's a ton of advantages of digital tests because 
even if you take the same you know, plot drawing task that I showed you on this slide, and if you have a digital version, then you have every single pen stroke. So you could basically see, you know, if someone's tremoring, maybe that gives you some indication of Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, if you see that the long pauses, maybe this is telling you something about attention or memory issues that, you know, might not be apparent if you're just looking at the final image. And so we've developed actually quite a few. So we have probably a hundred plus um, different types of cognitive tests that we also give away for free that run on phones and tablets and computers. Um, and, you know, we started off um, with developing new hearing tests. And so we have a lot of tests, especially of central auditory processing, um, lots of visual tests, similar to the ones I showed in the perceptual learning studies, um, cognitive control tasks, um, food intelligence. And, you know, one of the things that we've been doing is trying to make this so the tests are, once again, accessible and valid. And so hearing is kind of the one of the first areas we're working in, where basically if you look at audiology, you have this problem where, you know, so here you have an audiologist who is testing this organ on hearing, and you have this special audiogram. And so essentially what happens is a tone is played, um, and the participant, you know, raises their hand, you know, if they hear that tone, it just gets quieter and quieter. But this very simple test it's extremely expensive. So the audiologist is a highly paid trained physician. The audiogram is a very expensive piece of equipment. The soundproof room is hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending upon the circumstance. And so many people never get an audiogram. Um, and so, and the other thing is that even if you do get an audiogram, about half of people who have self-complaints of hearing difficulties do find an audiogram. So this is where the term hidden hearing loss comes from, is that um, a lot of these tests don't actually predict how people perform in environmental hearing situations. So when we first started developing this application, portable automated rapid testing, um, we were looking to see whether we could translate a lot of tests of psychoacoustics that were run in university labs, get them so that they could run on just a standard, in this case, iPad with consumer grade headphones, and here's a $30 microphone that we can use to calibrate the system and see whether we can get those that will kind of run in a way that would be portable and be able to test people at home. And what we found was that, you know, this is kind of a complicated summary figure, but um, we could find that if we test people um, in the lab or at home, that we have very high correspondence of their performance. Um, and that we've replicated across multiple studies. In fact, that even having people just use their own phone and their own headphones works just as well in most cases as a calibrated system with specialized headphones in the lab. And what's nice is that these are tasks that, you know, conventionally weren't even accessible in audiology companies because they'd either take too long to run um, or that the audiologists weren't trained on them. And so we could basically get, you know, tests that used to take an hour down to five or 10 minutes, depending upon the test, and also get just as good data. Um, and so the goals that we really have, you know, is that if we're able to be able to get more tests in there, then maybe we could develop these kind of cognitive profiles that might tell us you know, which people might require different interventions. And so, um, like when we first started looking at this, it's just with the hearing tests, it's take eight hours of hearing testing, and can we get that down into an hour? Um, and then for a screener, like maybe we get that down to 10 minutes. And then same thing with the different cognitive tests. And that if we're able to, you know, get this information that we can measure, you know, what might be somebody's cognitive need, um, then this could guide the training programs. Um, and, you know, all of this, you know, is something that does rely upon getting larger data sets. Um, and, but the goal really would be that, like, the more that we're able to essentially develop these tests, run them in larger groups of people, share them with other labs, that we might be able to move to a point where we're going to kind of have, you know, better data sets that are going to be more representative 
um, and kind of get past this point where like, you know, that index that I showed you where like, you know, right now it just, there's no way to, you know, deal with the current literature where like everyone's doing something different. So one path is like, we're trying to run thousands of people with our studies. Another path is that as ourselves and other groups start sharing the outcome measures, then if other groups to adopt some of our outcomes, we could adopt some of theirs. We might also be able to come up with some ways to be able to compare across these data sets. Um, <laughs> the other thing, which I think is kind of important about what we've been doing, um, and this is from that project that we're doing in schools, um, is really try to design applications that are kind of reaching different populations. And so like with this study that I like with the EFLIC Math Foundations, we're specifically bringing in, um, you know, the Black and Latinx uh, kind of school children that we're using in our studies as people part of their design team. Um, we have another study that we are waiting for feedback on where we're trying to train people with low vision on, once again, visual perceptual learning approaches. But from day one, we have people with low vision in the conditions that we're planning on treating as part of our design team, um, giving feedback on, you know, what are their needs? How do they interact with the different stimuli? And making sure that, you know, what you come up with at the end is inclusive of the people who want to reach. Mm -hmm. um, we are using AI in some of our studies. Um, and once again, we're trying to use individualized models of people as opposed to normative models so that you don't have a system that basically tries to fit everybody to some norm. Um, and so that, you know, this is something that, you know, there's all sorts of arguments about bias and AI and they're true. At the same time, AI really is also a great method to better customize things to individuals. Um, you know, here actually another thing we're trying to look at, and, and actually other stages as well, is that if you're trying to look at, you know, at whether it's vision or cognition, is that everyone wants to treat these things as traits. You know, you do a cognitive test, this is who you are. You do an IQ test, this is how smart you are. The reality is that these things fluctuate with time in all of us. And that, you know, just trying to understand not just, you know, the extent to which some test provides a score, but how these fluctuate across time is something that is also much easier if you are able to have people running tests at home on their own devices that could do repeated times. Um, and then the other thing we're doing in a lot of our studies is um, you know, applying kind of asset based models. So like, you know, instead of, you know, really focusing on what is your deficit, we're going to treat your deficit, asking what are your goals? How do we help you reach your goals? Um, and, you know, we do some studies in autism and ADHD. And, you know, once again, the idea is that instead of trying to focus on Um, and then another thing that um, we're trying to move forward um, is we've been trying to build this TRIP initiative. So as we've been building all these tools and we're trying to, um, you know, create these larger data sets, um, we've been really looking at, you know, how can we engage students in community colleges or state schools or other locations so that they're able to be part of large scale research studies and so that there could be local components that will lead to kind of scholarship within you know, each of the regions at the same time contribute to getting these large data sets that we need to be representative. So in closing, um, I'm definitely a fan of the promise of brain training games. I think that, you know, as I said, the brain is a bunch of circuits. All of these circuits I think are suboptimal. Um, that you know, the right training can improve them to some extent but we really need to change the way we do science if we really want to be effective in this. So it's not just a simple problem of working memory is domain general, we'll train you in one task, everything's going to be better. Um, it's just much more complicated. Um, and that, you know, it requires large data sets, it requires collaboration across researchers using common outcome measures, um, and really being systematic, uh, you know, what are the details of the training methodologies? Um, and so Brain Game Center, the goal is to be kind of a focus for studies of this. And then also I want to kind of highlight our group at Northeastern where we created the Sound Mind Collaboratory, which 
is a growing group, and the all the studies I'm showing kind of involve you know people across the line. Thank you. So much from this uh, fascinating talk. I'm sure it will generate many, many questions um, among uh, participants. <laughs> and if not, I have questions in my own. Okay. Yes. I think ultimately they are. And in fact, we have some projects where we're using games specifically for a couple different things. So one would be to get people to do more um, testing trials, because um, if you want to motivate people to do more sessions, games can help. And then the other is to get in more ecological validity. So I kind of mentioned this issue with hearing tests where people's self-reported hearing is um, very different than what they're tested with in the audiology. Well, some of this might be the fact that whenever we're doing any real national hearing task, we're always multitasking because there's always something else going on. If you think about you're at a restaurant, is you're talking with somebody, you're eating your food, you might be trying to flag down the waiter, you might be overhearing that someone else said your name and that, you know, this is cognitively demanding. And so if you could create games that inject these hearing tests in different degrees of complexity. So some of them are just looking at, you know, how do you do the test with the noise? But then you could also say, well, um, how do you perform when the noise is spatialized versus non-spatialized? Um, how do you perform when there are multitasking um, aspects of the game. And so once again, on the measurement side, it's, it's a design issue, but I think that you could get better measurements um, with the games it properly designed than with our standard tasks. Uh, I was just wondering, Ben, you mentioned that uh, for children who do like the games, uh, they perform less well when the games can be like they're distracting or very interesting. I was wondering if it generalizes to adults who are technically supposed to be able to more focus on like the task. So we have some studies that we just are writing this up now where um, we're doing a clinical trial on older adults where we're looking at how do they perform when they do the same task gamified or non-gamified. So everybody either did the gamified task first or the non-gamified task first, you know, in a training study. Um, and then what we're looking at baseline scores of inhibitor control and trying to predict um, whether people, you know, our hypothesis would be that if you have good inhibitor control, you'll learn more from the game because you'll benefit from motivational structures. If you have poor inhibitor control, you'll learn worse from the game because it has more distractions and it'll be harder to learn from it. And we're essentially seeing that pattern. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, but even when we started looking back at college students, where we looked at whether on baseline scores they had high or low and ever control, we basically found that the people who did better on the games were the ones who had better inhibitory control scores at baseline. Um, so, and part of this though is the design of the game. So there's a new grant that, which again, I'm waiting to see how it will be reviewed, but there we're trying to design games that would be perhaps more older adult friendly and not involve as much of the distractions that you have with the arcade style, style games that are made for the college students. And so there we think that the older adults on average might learn more from the games um, if they're appropriate to you know the cognitive baseline essentially. So it's a little complex, but I do think that once again, it's explainable and predictable if you have the right models. So 
So with the baseball players, we did tests of acuity. We did tests of contrast sensitivity. We actually looked across the visual field to see where the transfer was to. And um, we found that on average, um, it was transferring across all these different conditions. If you look on individual players, some of them improved more in the left eye than the right eye. Some of them, you know, improved on contrast sensitivity, but not acuity. And so on an individual level, there's a lot of different learning phenotypes that we didn't have enough power to explain very well. We didn't do imaging. Um, but what I think is going on is that the baseball players all start off very, very good. So, you know, their starting vision was what in the US we call 2013. So basically what a normal person could see at 13 feet, they could stand 20 feet back at feet. And that by the end, they could see um, at 20 feet what a normal person would need to see at 10 feet. And, and um, so probably what's happening is that they all have really good vision, but they also have areas where their vision could be a little bit better. And so, you know, with contrast sensitivity, you know, there, there are some players where they got a little bit better. And then we had some players who also said that, you know, they were able to see the ball better at night games. And so maybe it's that, you know, that improvement led to effect in that player as opposed to somebody who, um, you know, got better in, you know, just their left eye, you know, maybe that's helping them, you know, for their batting stance. And that, um, I, I think it's kind of individualized of what's happening there. It, you know, if we're able to get larger samples or do imaging, I, I think that that could be informative as well. Um, but, you know, the, I think the underbelly of almost all these training studies is that whenever you see something that changes on an average, you find that you start looking at the individuals, they're all learning slightly different things. And that's something that's also kind of underappreciated in the literature. Yeah, I have a question more about the figure that you had um, with the lambic task and this and the uh, skin. Uh, it was on the x-axis, you had 14 days, I think, so two weeks. And I was wondering about sustainability. So let's say if you stop the task, uh, if you measure up to like a month, two months, do you see that it stays? Does it plateau? Like, is there a plateau after two, three weeks that the person stops learning and basically like they, they stay at the same level? So just a question more general, like, did you do like more long-term follow-up to see what is the effect uh, in the long term? So I'll start with on the perceptual learning literature. There, people have shown that if you, especially with amblyopia, if you keep on training, um, that you keep on finding improvement. So there's some nice paper by Dennis Levi that, you know, kind of shows, you know, you train for like a week and it looks like you find an acetone. Then you train for another month and it looks like you have another one. You train for even more months and it keeps on going. And so um, there definitely are examples in perceptual learning where training get better and better and better. And then there's also cases where people have tested people two years later or with a baseball team, I tested them one year later. And uh, it, um, a lot of the learning effects do stay. On the working memory side, um, there are individualized trajectories. So there's some people who ask metope and they just don't get better as we keep on training them. There's others that keep on getting better and better and better. Um, that there's a bunch of studies where you test people a month later and you don't see as much savings as you might expect so that, you know, performance will go back down, but then other studies show that it stays up a little bit. And then what's really interesting is that there's some studies that show if you start looking at far transfer to like, you know, untrained tasks or fluid intelligence tasks, that sometimes that only emerges a month later and you don't see that immediately after training. And so one thing that hasn't been studied very well, but I think is really important to understand is how these trainings change the way that people interact with their environment. Because in some cases, um, actually a great example would be, let's say, perceptual learning to improve dyslexia. So there's different, um, you know, hypotheses of 
routes of dyslexia. There's a whole magnocellular that, you know, um, vision and motion training could help with dyslexia. There's definitely some people who should be good candidates for that. So I could train somebody in a way that might be really helpful to address a visual concern that could lead to dyslexia. But afterwards, I would not expect them to instantly be able to read that because the visual deficit would potentially make it difficult to learn to read. But only once you leave that, then they now need to basically go through a process of learning to read before you would actually be able to see improvement on a reading test. And so you think about baseball. Well, sometimes that, like the coach kept on saying that the players saw the ball differently. So their behaviors might have been reinforcing the vision skills that they were improved. With some of the working memory training, that in some people it might be that it changes how they're interacting with things in their environment, and that that leads to growth that could be occurring after the study. In other cases, maybe it doesn't change the way they interact with the environment, and so that's why it fades. And so this is something that certainly differs across individuals, studying studies, it's not well understood. Thank you for the talk. Um, of the many domains in which you're applying these methods, mental health was one of them. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, are your methods you know, mainly useful for like detecting different types of deficits? Can it be used to improve on certain aspects of symptomatology and so on? Um, kind of all the above. So we have a clinical trial in ADHD right now that's focused on executive function training. And so that one really is looking at trying to, you know, approve, you know, working memory and attention and seeing how that might give rise to improvements in school environments and, you know, other symptomologies. And so there was, again, an individual um, difference focus grant. And so that we expect that there's going to be some phenotypes of ADHD that might be more compatible with training than others. Um, there's a study that we've been running in schizophrenia that has the same vision training that we use in the baseball team. And there, once again, you know, we're trying to look at, you know, some different phenotypes. What we see there is that there's definite vision improvements that we're seeing. Um, there's also some changes in symptoms that we see in some people. And um, there, the N isn't large enough to kind of do as much of a phenotypical analysis as we would in the ADHD study where that study we're trying to train, I think there are um, 600 um, participants, um, but we have some studies looking at autism where once again, we're trying to look at different perceptual phenotypes that might be predictive of um, complex tasks such as, you know, recognizing emotions and faces or voices. Um, and <clears throat> then again, you know, it's, they're all kind of the same concept is that if we could identify what might be the different types of phenotypes of these conditions, that some of those phenotypes might be a good match. So for instance, if there is a kind of visual integration um, concern that is leading to a um, deficit of being able to recognize faces, then um, maybe vision training would help. If it's not vision related, then there's no reason to think that vision training would help. And we could test those hypotheses. Um, and so all this work is kind of in progress. So I don't really have a lot to say, oh, we've done it, it's all. But at least this is you know, the approach that we're taking. Oh. Please. Okay. Yeah, I'm surprised no one from the so city of Rome is both connected neuroscience people and people from neuropsychology. Um, and I'm surprised that no one on the neuropsychology side asked any question because to me, your talk seemed extremely relevant to what they're about to do in, uh, in their career. So <laughs> both the, um, uh, the assessment side so these people will spend essentially all their time assessing um, uh, uh, clients um, for their cognitive um, abilities. 
and uh, and they're dependent on uh, publishers of tests that cost a lot of money. Uh, there, uh, these tests are typically uh, of the old type, so paper pencil or more or less. Uh, so all the tests that you're developing, uh, I think, are extremely relevant to that. Uh, so I'm surprised no one uh, said that they were interested in talking to you and maybe validating uh, your test. Uh, have you been in communication with uh, neuropsychologists? Um, not in Canada. Uh, no, but, but yeah, so basically, so um, there, for instance, there's a study called the Adult Change in Thought Study, which is run out of University of Washington and Kaiser Hospital. Yeah. And so this is a longitudinal study that's been studying older adults, um, you know, for about 30 years, and then, you know, they do autopsies after death and look at um, kind of neurodegeneration in the brain and such. And that basically, we've been um, digitizing all of their assessments. And so um, we're right now we're in the process of trying to transition that whole study from the paper test to the digital test. And so we definitely have a whole array of classic um, neuropsych tests. Um, and I, I will say that I do kind of have a private goal of trying to make tests that are better than what most of the companies sell that are available for free. I don't think it will be very difficult. It's not difficult. <laughs> and the whole thing is that if we get it so that people are able to do more of these tests at home, yeah. and that they're less expensive so that, you know, it's not a burden uh, you know, money or insurance or things of that sort to be able to get tested, right. then you could help a lot more people. And so my belief that's is that's a bit more tricky because uh, these people are counting on clients mm -hmm. to... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so. Have the people here in neuropsychology. Yeah, exactly. No, but at home or not, I mean, you're dependent on yeah. publishers. I mean, I so if the tests were free and you... Yeah, the only thing that I, I think we have to, to be careful with is that, you know, as a neuropsychologist, they, I, I use uh, paper tests and, you know, classical things. I also use some uh, computerized tests, which I, I love because they're super sensitive. So I think it's a very, very difficult possibility for that, of course. But... When you think about, you know, like the result of the test is important, whatever, whether it's a, it's a paper test or a particular test. But as a neuropsychologist, the even more important is the way that the person is doing the, the task, all the qualitative stuff that we are looking for during the assessment. So how do you think we can we can see some of this during a computerized test, but not not always as good as we can see it during like a more classical test. So what do you yeah. think about that? So I think the, the first thing I'd say is that the idea of making tests accessible at home, um, you know, is really twofold. One is you can reach more people, um, but then the other is that you could get a little bit more data that then can inform what you might do when you come into the clinic. So that it's a lot of the ways that I think about that home testing is that um, it's super useful for screeners. So like, you know, one could make a, you know, self-administered at home test and that this could help, you know, people understand things that might be areas of concern. Um, I don't think the computer is gonna be very good at diagnostic. I think that the humans are still critical in that process. But, um, then the other thing is that you know once you got you know some of the things that you'd observe as a neuropsychologist um are things that you know for instance when we do things like naming tasks or um you know verbal fluency tasks we are actually having people say the things out loud um and so we can do voice analytics on these and so there's a certain number of things that we could look at that are quantifiable that would correlate with what you would normally do as a neuropsychologist. There, and this is all information that then is accessible that would allow the neuropsychologist to use their time a little bit more efficiently. So that you know, there's this data that you know can be done fairly inexpensively, you know, often at home. Um, that 
then when you actually interact with that person can generate more specific questions. And um, there's still gonna be some things that these um, tasks will fail at that the human knows are relevant. Um, but like as a collaborative tool, you know, I think that all it does is serve people better. If I think it's the companies that say, well, we're powered by AI and we'll do the full diagnosis and humans are no longer needed. That that I think is misleading because those things, you know, can make horrible mistakes. Um, but as tools that provide information and access um, there, I think that it only adds. But I agree, it did help a lot. I think we're not for diagnostic, we're not there yet. I don't know if of course it will get better and better, but in the, the human part it will still be. But I, I do agree that for a psychologist, it would be super useful as well in all these labs. Um, for the screening part, I think it can be useful, but we already use like questionnaires that are quite good for screening. Depends which population, but it depends on what you mean yeah. by quite good because there's a lot of people who either do fine on the screening tasks or don't do fine. That, um, you know, that information can be gathered that would be useful from these other tasks, right? Because I mean, I think that, like, I mean, the thing that bothers me the most is, you know, you know, like these new Alzheimer's drugs where, you know, they say, oh, we give rise to cognitive improvement because someone did like a six question questionnaire and then on average, there's a slight change in it. Like realistically, you know, that's with the noise and that if they actually did some, you know, digital cognitive tasks, I think you'd have a much better picture. Um, I don't think one should get a, go away from the self-report because I think there's a lot of time, like the hearing test I mentioned, where, you know, self-reports the gold standard. Like if they have trouble hearing, the test says they're fine. It doesn't mean they're fine. But I definitely think there needs to be a balance between it. Um, I definitely think that the standard neuropsych tasks overlook a huge amount of what we've learned from neuroscience and psychology over the last few decades, where, you know, a lot of the, you know, tasks that people use in the lab uh, just never make it into the clinic, even though they are discriminated. So that's where, like, you know, make these things available, game apply them. Um, people can do a lot of them at home. And you basically get a much more complete picture before you talk with them. Well, I do agree. I think that there is kind of a, a from the data that, that uh, the companies who uh, provide that, that's like in Portugal or that. I didn't think that part of my question would be controversial. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think the other aspect of your talk is uh, will be uh, eventually transformative for neuropsychology because at the moment there are very few uh, brain training techniques that are used by them. They, they basically do assessment and that's pretty much it. Um, so brain training is will become, I think, I mean, it should become super important for neuropsychology in the future. Uh, so it will change the way, hopefully, that neuropsychology is practiced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, so you, you mostly uh, talked about video games that were designed with such basic functions in mind. And that's the like the basis of, of uh, like why it is transferable. Uh, what do you think of video games that are already out there, like commercial video games that weren't designed with these basic functions in mind, but in which some people like with which some people engage a lot, and like these these video games can be very rich, diverse. And also, they produce a lot of data. So, in also in terms of uh, maybe diagnostic or stuff like that, um, do you think that some conditions can be uh, like they can help with diagnosing uh, or like measuring some aspects of cognition? Uh, and do you think they can uh, induce training the way uh, Green and Bavelier uh, showed uh, with the uh, seminar paper? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the second part first. Um, and actually, um, I, I have multiple projects with Sean Green, and um, he's visiting me next week. 
Um, and so what I'd say about the, so if you start looking at complex tasks in general, so video games would be one example, but um, learning to play an instrument, learning a second language, um, you know, there's um, a lot of complex nationalistic tasks that um, have been shown to have benefits. And uh, generally, if I give a talk to, let's say, a community audience, and I'm talking about brain training, what I typically say is that you want to do activities that are challenging to you. And that when you no longer see the challenge, so, you know, let's say you play, uh, you know, crossword puzzles or a video, or a video game, whatever it is, like there's going to be a certain point when you're learning. And there's a certain point where you're really good at it and you're not learning much. Generally, that's the point where it's probably not doing much more for you. During that learning phase, that that's where, you know, there's evidence across studies that that's good. So the thing which is nice about the designed um, programs that I'm doing is that they're adaptive in the goal that, you know, they keep on providing incremental challenge at each point in time. Even though I do think that they often, they don't have enough variance. So like, you know, at a certain point, people start overfitting the games. And so the improvement might be just, they've learned the game of the game. Um, but generally I'd say that, uh, um, you know, any challenging activity can have benefit. And that the difference between the design ones and the naturalistic ones are that um, I think that typically a better optimal training can be, has to come from design. But that um, a lot of the ones that people are selling are not necessarily better than what you find in nature. And actually we have some um, projects where we're doing auditory training, we're comparing music-based interventions that we're developing to um, more psychoacoustical-based interventions and comparing those. As far as the measurements, once again, I'd say that you can measure things from games. You can measure, you know, things from just, you know, how are people interacting on smartphones, you know? So there's lots of um, stealth testing, you know, that exists in the world. And that's a term that's being used more and more. I do think that once again, there's certain things to observe from that. But if you really want to have enough exemplars of a particular challenge, that you need to design for that. And so that's really the difference is that um, going back to the radi radiologist, like I was doing some vision training with radiologists. Why do you think that could work? Is in an hour, I could give them a thousand really hard cases to see where it might take them three years to experience a thousand hard cases in managers. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll continue uh, with uh, a glass of wine. Uh, so thank you a lot. <laughs> Thank you.